Right, hello everyone, welcome back. Um, I hope uh, the uh, the lecture uh, preceding this, the, the one on enzymes, um, didn't pose too many problems. Um, like always, any concerns, any problems, anything you don't understand, uh, send me an email, okay? Or, or uh, contact me somehow, and uh, I'll address those qu uh, questions as soon as I can. So, as a continuation of the of the lecture that we had last time um, on enzymes, today we're going to go a bit further and talk about enzyme kinetics, okay? Uh, and also how <clears throat> how enzymes are somewhat regulated, okay, by inhibitors. And this is basically an introduction to enzyme kinetics. So. Uh, <clears throat> and also an intro introduction to enzyme inhibition as well, so it's not going to be exhaustive. Okay, uh, you would need to spend um, a, a whole module uh, if you wanted to exhaust enzyme kinetics and and inhibition. So, so this is just going to be an introduction. Right then, so <clears throat> so we'll talk about enzyme kinetics. Okay, uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the some of the details about the different features of enzyme kinetics. Okay. Uh, in order to understand that enzyme kinetics, we'll talk about uh, some of the uh, some of the some of the features, okay, of enzyme kinetics, which is to do with the Michaelis constant Km and the maximum speed of an enzyme, okay, with the Vmax. Okay, uh, we look at uh, how substrate concentration, okay, affects both K Km and Vmax. Okay, and uh, we'll also work out how to, how we use Km and Vmax from a graph. We've talked about um, the enzyme kinetics. We'll look, we'll, look, we'll then look into inhibition. Okay, the different types of in inhibitors enzymes are faced with, and the effect they have on things like Km and Vmax. Okay, so understanding the impact of different types of inhibitors on enzyme catalysis. Okay, so what exactly is enzyme kinetics then? Okay, so as it says over here, kinetics, okay, it's about movement. Uh, and that's what we're basically studying, okay. E enzyme kinetics studies the reaction rates of enzyme catalyzed reactions, okay, and how these, uh, these reactions are affected by changes in conditions. Okay, so there's all kinds of conditions which affect enzyme kinetics. I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that in, 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 a, in a few minutes. But why do we study enzyme kinetics? Okay, it is very, <clears throat> it is very useful. Okay, enzyme kinetics is very useful for measuring all kinds of things. Okay, so if if you look at it at a as a physiological level okay we all express enzymes we all express thousands and thousands of different types of enzymes and we we are all different people okay our genetics are different so uh the concentration the amount uh, the type of enzyme being expressed at a particular time is roughly the same between a human being to human being but there are differences okay uh so at a physiological level, looking at enzyme kinetics helps us to understand why people are different. Okay. Now, at a at a simply, um, but at a molecular level, okay, uh, all all the data that we all the data that we get um, about enzymes is usually done in the lab, and it's usually done at the molecular level. Okay, and from 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 this from these experiments we do in in the lab and looking at enzyme kinetics from the enzyme kinetics we can work out for example the concentration of an, of an enzyme in a mixture okay we can do that by because we know certain things we might know certain things about the enzyme about about its catalytic activity how fast it can actually go because somebody else might have done that okay somebody else might have done that so we can use that data to, to work out the concentration of an enzyme in a mixture. Okay, we can also work out its purity. We we talked about uh, protein purification in a previous lecture, and we said that purity is is is, is an important uh, feature, obviously, of of enzyme purification of protein purification. Well, 
we we can tell how pure a sample is okay by looking at uh, if 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 the sample we're looking at uh, is an enzyme okay we know uh, we we can measure how much protein there is by doing um, <clears throat> an absorbance an ultraviolet absorption i say at 280 nanometers um so we can use that okay to to calculate exactly how much protein there is and if we know the catalytic activity okay of the enzyme we should be expecting a certain rate of activity and so if we get that then that's fine because we can say that it's it's 100 pure but if we don't quite get that that means that there are other proteins in the mixture which are not which are not the enzyme okay so we can get the specific activity depending on the purity of the enzyme okay we can also get the catalytic efficiency and us on our specificity for different substrates we'll, we'll come on to catalytic efficiencies in, in a later slide okay um comparisons of different forms of the same enzyme in different tissues okay or, or from different organisms okay so there are <clears throat> the same enzyme can be expressed uh in different tissues uh, but when I say the same enzyme, it, it's not exactly the same enzyme. It might be a little, there might be a little modification of the enzyme from different tissues, but essentially it's the same. Okay, and because of that small modification, maybe it's an isomer of the enzyme. Okay, uh, the enzyme will then behave differently. Okay, <clears throat> uh, and also looking at the effects of inhibitors. Okay. Uh, enzymes can be controlled by inhibitors. Many of the foodstuffs that 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 you consume uh, are also inhibitors. A lot of the drugs that we take are inhibitors of enzymes. Okay, so we can uh, we can take a lot of information from uh, from these experiments by exposing enzymes to molecules which we think are inhibitors and see exactly how much they inhibit the enzyme by okay and then if it's if the inhibitor is a, is a drug if, if somebody is doing an, an experiment uh, with a pharmacological uh, molecule okay a pharmacological molecule which may be an inhibitor okay we want to know um, how much the enzyme is inhibited by that particular inhibitor okay do we need a little bit of the inhibitor do we need some more of it okay and we can use that information then to come up with uh, the amount of uh, inhibitor that you actually need to have a to have a beneficial effect okay so this uh, comes down to dosage okay so we can get um, information about what the dosage should be okay if the pharmacological drug um, is an inhibitor, we can get information about how much we need of the inhibitor to, um, to have an effect, a beneficial effect. Uh, also, at the end of the day, what we really want is to, we want to get as much information as possible about the enzyme. Okay, the more information we have, uh, the better the better we can predict how the enzyme behaves um, in certain conditions okay so if basic things like measurement of velocity you know how how fast the reaction rate is okay uh, that's an important uh, uh, data point that we that we need okay we can compare enzymes under different conditions or from different tissues or, or organisms okay we can understand how different uh, differences relate to physiology. Okay, so like I said before, you know, people are different. Uh, people's physiology might be uh, from human being to human being. Every uh, people's physiology is roughly the same, but there are differences. Okay, so we can relate that those differences. Uh, at the molecular level and see what uh, impact uh, the differences in the enzymes are having from person to person okay uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all this but uh, just have a look through this okay and hopefully you understand the importance of
uh, getting to grips with enzyme kinetics. Okay. okay so let's um, let's look at um, let's look at the velocity of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Okay. Now, how fast the enzyme can actually catalyze that reaction? We you know we talked about before in the previous lecture how how enzymes speed up reactions you know to the to 10 to the power 7 10 to the power 14 fold okay these these all relate to the velocity of the enzyme catalyzed reaction now the enzyme catalyzed reaction can be um, can be affected by many different things but these four would be the more physiologically relevant okay so there's there's uh, there's substrate concentration and inhibitors okay and there's also pH and temperature. Okay. Now, the substrate concentration, obviously the substrate binds to the enzyme's active site. So if there's more of it, potentially the, the, the reaction can go faster up to a point. But if there are inhibitors present, okay, uh, it can affect how well the enzyme works on that substrate. We'll talk about inhibitors later on. Okay, But another thing, uh that we should also bear in bear in mind is the ph and temperature we saw in a previous graph from the from the from, from the previous lecture how ph and temperature can affect enzymes okay so these two ph and temperature affect the three-dimensional structure of the enzyme okay so remember the enzyme is a, is a three-dimensional structured molecule, and it's the three-dimensional structure which um, impacts, which affects how well it works. If it folds properly, then it works properly. Okay, but if the temperature is too high or is too low, or the pH is too high or too low, this impacts on the enzyme's three-dimensional structure. Okay, and these two things, pH and temperature, can actually denature. So if they if they're not correct, they denature the enzyme when i say denature denature basically means that the enzyme is misfolded or the protein is misfolded and if it's misfolded obviously the three-dimensional structure is not correct okay so so this is a this is just to show you what would happen um in the absence of an enzyme so this is a chemical reaction a product is formed okay this is the substrate concentration so the more substrate concentration you have the more product that is formed okay so the reaction velocity increases but it increases in a proportional way okay in other words uh, the more substrate concentration you have the faster the reaction this is in the absence of an enzyme okay so if you think about the one that we always mention carbon dioxide reacting with water to produce carbonic acid well if you have more co2 and more water in the mix the faster um, you'll get the production of carbonic acid okay but the thing is but it happens in a proportional way so it's so it's represented here as a straight line okay now if you add an enzyme into the mix okay you see it's not a straight line it's a straight line up to a point okay and then it starts to plateau off so this because it's a straight line this this um uh, the substrate concentration that's represented here up to the point where it where it is a straight line we say that's proportional so up to a point the substrate concentration leads to a proportional increase in the velocity of the reaction okay but what you'll notice that um that the this is steeper okay and that's what enzymes do uh, we can we can look at the, the the speed of the reaction by looking at the steepness of the line okay the steeper it is the faster the reaction okay now there comes a point uh, where the speed <clears throat> kind of plateaus off okay this doesn't mean that the speed is slow it just means it's, it's really fast but it can't go any faster than this okay uh, doesn't matter how much more substrate you add okay uh, the speed will remain the same the problem over here is that uh, it's the enzyme concentration here okay the enzyme concentration here is is um, there's just no more free enzyme left to deal with the excessive amounts of substrate uh, 
okay in order to increase this you will need to add more enzyme okay so up to this point okay when 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 it starts to curve and become and plateaus off there is just no more free enzyme left to convert the extra substrate to product okay so substrate concentration has an effect on enzyme velocity okay then let's look at velocity in a bit more detail here okay so we're looking at the rate of reaction so when we talk about velocity we're talking about rate of reaction now in order for uh, an enzyme here labeled as e to form a product here labeled as p at the end okay it has to undergo um certain changes okay but first of all enzyme has to meet up with the substrate okay so substrate has to interact with the enzyme and so the substrate uh, fits into the into the active side of the enzyme and once the substrate fits into the active side of the enzyme okay it becomes the enzyme substrate complex okay now how quickly this happens depends upon several things but but whatever it depends upon there's a there's a certain rate at which this enzyme substrate uh, complex is formed okay but once this enzyme substrate complex is formed okay uh, then the enzyme can catalyze the reaction and, and form product enzyme doesn't get used up in the reaction so it becomes freed up okay ready to perform another round of catalysis now how fast this enzyme substrate complex becomes uh, or how fast the substrate is catalyzed to become product is defined as rate two okay um, and this again depends upon uh, different things it depends upon the enzyme itself how quickly it can it can actually catalyze the reaction now over here I've, I've, there's it's, it's a reversible reaction okay so enzyme substrate before it can be catalyzed there's a there's a there's a good chance that it can it can dissociate from the enzyme okay so enzyme substrate can form enzyme substrate complex but it can also dissociate uh, to form enzyme independent enzyme and independent substrate and how fast this happens okay is is defined as rate minus one okay now in textbooks you will see this as k1 and and this rate as k minus one and this as k2 and the reverse reaction k minus two okay now when it comes to uh, enzyme substrate complex um, undergoing rate two to form the product now theoretically um, it, enzyme product okay so the product can become the substrate theoretically speaking okay um so it, it can happen but the, in real life practically speaking it doesn't really happen okay uh in order for product uh to reverse react to become the original substrate okay that would require um you know a, a different enzyme even okay uh but this reaction equation uh is all about a particular enzyme Okay, so if it requires a different enzyme, this reaction doesn't really happen. This reverse reaction doesn't really happen. So that's why it's down as a dashed line. So the reverse reaction can happen theoretically, but in reality, it doesn't really happen. Okay, so enzyme substrate becomes enzyme substrate complex, and then the substrate is catalyzed, um, the reaction is catalyzed to form product. Okay, so you can see from here then, that how quickly the product forms really depends upon how quickly the enzyme substrate can form enzyme substrate complex and how quickly the enzyme substrate complex can form product before the enzyme substrate uh, dissociates to form enzyme and substrate okay so it depends upon these three really these uh, these three rates rate plus rate one rate minus one and rate two okay and that and it's these things that dictate how quickly uh, the reaction proceeds so you see the velocity is is not a simple it's not it's not something that is very simple it is quite complex okay it depends on different different features okay but uh, <clears throat> we can sort of uh, simplify this a lot uh, we know that the rate increases 
So the rate increases, rate 1 and rate 2, if we have more enzyme present. Okay, if we have more enzyme present up to a point that is, okay, so if the enzyme concentration increases, the rate at which these rates proceed to form product increases. Okay, similarly, if the substrate concentration increases, again, there's, uh, if there's more substrate there, the, there's a bigger chance the substrate will bind to enzyme to form this, okay, and then to tend to undergo the next uh, um, reaction to form product okay so the higher the enzyme concentration and the higher the substrate concentration okay up to a point that is okay the rate of uh, of these reactions will increase okay now what remains constant is what we call the catalytic property of the enzyme okay a enzyme a molecule of enzyme let's just say that this one molecule of enzyme let's say it can only it can only uh, catalyze five reactions per second okay in optimal conditions it can re it can only do five reactions per second that will remain the same okay provided the enzymes in, in its optimal conditions it will remain the same okay that won't change okay so if you look at one particular molecule of enzyme it can it can only carry out you know uh, a maximal um, rate of five molecules per second okay so that's just that's just a figure that i just i've just come up with uh, just to demonstrate that um what doesn't change okay so what doesn't change is the uh the catalytic property of the enzyme okay it can only catalyze so many reactions per second in optimal conditions so that won't change Okay, so let me just illustrate that uh, with this diagram here. So let's just say there's five molecules of uh, of enzyme. Okay, five molecules per unit volume. So let's just say there's a volume here, and in that volume there are five molecules of enzyme. Okay, uh, and we we're assuming that the conditions are ideal here. Okay. Now it says here each molecule can catalyze a hundred reactions per second. So each one can catalyze 100 reactions per second now because we have five in this unit volume uh, the maximum rate of reaction would be 500 reactions per second okay provided that there is sufficient substrate okay that is what we call v max okay now at this point all the enzyme molecules are saturated with substrate okay so this is what we mean when we say sufficient substrate okay uh, each one, each one of these molecules have to be saturated with substrate. Okay, so this this uh, uh, this molecule can react, can deal with uh, 500 molecules per second. Okay, and it's it's assuming that there are other there are another 500 molecules waiting in line. Okay, for them to react with this enzyme. Okay, so. <clears throat> What this what this demonstrates also is that if you have five molecules, this is the speed which we which we can achieve five hundred reactions per second. Interestingly, if we had more enzyme present in the same volume and we had sufficient amounts of substrate, you can see, can't you? If we had five, and we have if we had five more, okay, then we could, so we had ten altogether. That, that would go up to 1,000 reactions per second. So the speed goes quicker. So, which means you can increase Vmax by increasing the enzyme concentration. Okay, enzyme concentration. So this graph just demonstrates what I was talking about before, about if we have, uh, this is the Vmax, for an enzyme concentration of 1x and now if we have an enzyme concentration where we double it we can increase vmax okay so this is what i mean when i say that you can increase vmax by increasing the enzyme concentration okay now another catalytic constant we um, not constant but another catalytic feature um, <clears throat> we often look at is kcat Okay. Now this is the, what we call the turnover number. Okay. 
uh, it's a measure of the, the rate of product formation at a specific enzyme concentration. So the enzyme, if we assume the enzyme concentration is fixed, okay, we're not, we're not, we're not doubling or tripling enzyme concentration. We have one fixed concentration of enzyme, okay? Um, then it's the, it's the rate at which product is formed, okay, for a specific enzyme concentration. So uh, another thing about KCAD that it, it's really a measure of K2, okay, which is the uh, which is the formation of of uh, product after enzyme and after after you get the formation of enzyme substrate complex. So it it doesn't disregard this, okay, but it but KCAD, okay, KCAD is also known as the as the rate. Okay, and uh, so this this is the uh, the the formula for calculating K cut. It's the V max divided by the enzyme concentration. Okay, so if we go back, okay, if I go back now, that is what we call that's another that's that's another way of saying catalytic property of the enzyme A. Enzyme A can only catalyze X reactions per second okay and that's the k cut okay uh, the higher the k cut the faster the enzyme can work okay now k cut is is a very useful uh, uh, parameter okay uh, but what we really want is we want we want to, a way to figure out uh, the whole reaction process okay we want to figure out the whole reaction process so this is important k cut is important because it gives you an idea of how quickly the uh, product is formed after the enzyme substrate complex formation but but it, we're, we're kind of disregarding almost how quickly the uh, substrate forms with the enzyme or and how, how quickly the substrate uh, links up with the enzyme in the catalytic site to form the enzyme substrate complex Okay, and how quickly this forms, okay, is is a measure of Km, the Michaelis constant. Okay, so a, a more useful measure of enzyme activity is this here, the K cat over Km. So how quickly the f how quickly the product is formed after the formation of the enzyme substrate complex. Okay, so you're taking into consideration both all these rates. Okay, uh, and that's the K cut over Km. We'll come back to K cut over Km in, in, in a few minutes. But uh, let me just show you um, the K cut, okay, the turnover number, the K cut of, uh, of many enzymes which we've, we've already come across before. So carbonic anhydrase, we know it's very quick. Okay, its turnover number is 600,000 molecules per second. Okay, so in other words, it can produce 600,000 molecules of product per second. Now, if we go down the list and look at lysozyme, okay, look how fast that is, 0.5. So it can it can produce 0.5 molecules of product per second. So now it looks to be extremely slow compared to carbonic anhydrase. Okay. Now there's a physiological reason for that, which 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 I'll come across, which I which I'll talk to talk about in a few minutes. Okay, but just let's just take that, let's just take it as face value at the moment. Okay, we can say that carbonic anhydrase is much quicker, uh, is one of the quicker enzymes in this list here. Okay, it can it can turn over six hundred thousand molecules of product compared to lysozyme, which can only turn over zero point five. Okay, so it would require two seconds just to turn over one molecule of product here for lysozyme. Okay. So KCAD is a useful parameter, okay, but uh, KCAD over KM is a much more useful parameter when, we, when we're looking at the overall uh, velocity of, of, of the reaction. Okay. Right then. Okay. just look at the substrate concentration again of an enzyme catalyzed reaction and let's break this graph into into its constituent parts okay uh, so 
at this sort of when when it's proportional, the proportional part of the graph, um, there is basically uh, it, there's lots of enzyme present, uh, and there isn't enough substrate. Okay, so uh, in other words, there's lots of spare capacity here for the enzyme. Okay, it can deal with a lot more substrate. So uh, provided we have this situation, okay, lots of enzyme and uh, not, not much substrate, the limiting factor in this scenario would be the substrate. Okay. The substrate is a limiting factor. And as, as, as long as the substrate is a limiting factor, the, the line here would be, will be straight, will be proportional. Okay. Now, when we reach the point at which uh, there's enough substrate, okay, uh, lots of substrate, so that this enzymes, all the enzymes are saturated, Okay, this is when we start to plateau off then. Okay, this is when we start to plateau off. Okay, and then once we're, in, we're, once we're really in the plateau zone, okay, now there's so much substrate that the limiting factor now is the enzyme. Okay, um, and in order to increase this, uh, the Vmax, you will need to put more enzyme in. Okay. Now, in um, in the lab, when, when we do experiments, we always have a fixed concentration of enzyme. Okay. Uh, to to work out the the useful parameters of uh, of the enzyme. Okay. So we always have a fixed. But obviously, in real life, uh, in the cell, uh, physiologically speaking, uh, the the, uh, the the cells will respond by doing all kinds of things. You know, but even one of those is perhaps in producing more enzyme. Okay, so it's a, it's a very dynamic uh, situation in the cell, but uh, not so dynamic when we're doing experiments looking at enzyme activity in the lab. Okay, so this is a, just a, I'd say this is more repetition just to illustrate the, the just to hammer down the point. Okay, so I'll skip that bit. Okay, and uh, now talk about Km, the Michaelis constant. Okay, so we looked at K cat, we looked at V max. Now let's look at Km, the Michaelis constant. Now the Km is not a rate of reaction. Okay, the Km is a measure of how uh, how the substrate binds to the uh, to the active side of the enzyme. Okay, so the Km is an is is of an enzyme is a substrate concentration. Okay, and it's defined as the substrate concentration required for half of Vmax. Okay, so here's Vmax, here's uh, so 50% of that, half of Vmax, and this is what we get. Okay, and uh, so it's <coughs> so it's a substrate concentration. Okay, and now that's an important thing to understand because uh, the, the the substrate binds to the the, to the enzymes catalytic side okay now the more you have of the substrate the more likely that the substrate will bind to the enzyme because if you think about it if there are lots of if in in, in a certain volume of space if there's some molecules of enzyme some molecules of substrate the enzyme isn't an intelligent molecule it doesn't go looking for the substrate as such it's just the probability that the substrate by random will bind to the enzyme now, if the substrate um, has a low affinity for the enzyme, it can it will come it will come in contact, but because it has a low affinity, it won't necessarily bind to the active side. Compare that to the to an enzyme which has a high affinity for that particular substrate. So the same situation, okay, the substrate comes into close contact, and because it has a high affinity, the substrate binds very tightly to the enzyme. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, so the Km of an enzyme, okay, is 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 a substrate concentration, and it's re and it's it's defined as the fifth is fifty percent or half of Vmax, okay, and it really talks about this part of the equation here, okay, how quickly the enzyme substrate complex is formed, okay, so the, it it really is about this rate here. Okay, uh, this rate, so rate 1 um, divided by the rate minus 1. Okay, so if if the affinity is really strong, 
and then this 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 arrow this red will be really quick if the affinity is really weak this red will be small and this red will be equally as small because the the, the substrate is coming on into contact with the enzyme but it's not binding tightly so it just comes straight off okay and as it comes straight back off that's governed by this red here okay so km is really a measure of this part of the of the, of the, of the equation okay <clears throat> So in in this in this graph here, we we can see uh, one the enzyme, okay, uh, enzyme one and enzyme two on a particular substrate. So the substrate is the same, but we expose it to two, two different enzymes. And um, we can see over here that enzyme one has a much higher affinity for the for this particular substrate than enzyme two. Okay, so um, you don't need that much um, substrate. Okay, for uh, for ends for with enzyme one compared to enzyme two, so enzyme one has a much higher affinity for this substrate than enzyme two. Okay, and therefore the initial velocity will be quicker. Okay, it binds substrate binds to the enzyme really quickly. It stays bound because it's, it's it is a tighter interaction, and we get product formation. So this thing happens. This process happens really quickly. If we take that, uh, if we take enzyme two. Enzyme substrate complex is formed, but because the interaction is weak, okay, it can go back to form enzyme and substrate, okay, and so the initial velocity is much slower, okay. So Km, okay, is it's it's so it's so it's defined as the substrate concentration required for half of V max, okay, but it's more complex than that. Okay, it, it's it's a substrate concentration, and it and it demonstrates how it demonstrates how tight the substrate binds to the active site. Okay, the smaller the KM, okay, the smaller the KM, the tighter the affinity for substrate. Um, I won't really go through this. Uh, this just shows you the, the relationship between Vmax and Km, which I think I've demonstrated in previous slides. Okay, so Km is half of Vmax, and it's as simple as that. Okay, but remember, K Vmax is a rate of catalysis, whereas Km is the is a measure of affinity of the substrate of, of the of the substrate for the enzyme. So Km is a substrate concentration. Okay, the smaller the Km. Okay, the smaller the Km, the tighter the affinity for that for that substrate for that enzyme. So again, this is this is, again. So I've I've I've, uh, I've mentioned this before, so <clears throat> I'll miss this as well. But just you know, be, just keeping um, these these uh, boxes in yellow. Okay, these are the really important bits to learn. Okay, the Km. Is an indicator of the affinity for a particular substrate, okay? And the lower the Km, the tighter the binding for that particular substrate, okay? Or in other words, the higher the Km, the weaker the binding for that substrate, okay? Now here's some Km values, okay? So we talked about uh, the K-cat values. So I've 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 listed some K-cat values. Uh, of these enzymes from the previous slide. Okay, now look at uh, um, carbonic anhydrase. Okay, look at the Km value here. Yeah. Okay, eight thousand. Eight thousand. So the so the affinity for um, of CO two to bind to carbonic anhydrase. Okay. Is extremely well is much bigger and what did we say about KMs the smaller the KM the tighter the binding okay compare that to lysozyme remember the K-cat value is very small but the KM is extremely small as well so in other words carbonic anhydrase has a poor affinity for its substrates okay so so that 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 rate plus one is slow 
but then the rate to the formation of the product is extremely quick. Okay, compare that to lysozyme, the rate at which, um, uh, sorry, how quickly the substrate binds, how tightly the substrate binds to the uh, to the active side of the enzyme, is really quick. Okay, based on this very small number, but then the subsequent formation of the product is slow. Okay, so taking one in isolation, K cut or the KM in isolation, doesn't really give you a, 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 the full story. Okay, it's really it's it's one over the other. Okay, K cut rather over KM, which gives you the full story of how quickly the product can be formed. Okay. <clears throat> Now, you might be thinking, well, um, how come that's the case? Okay, so let me just, okay, so if we now look at the next slide, okay. Now, when we look at the catalytic uh, efficiency of the enzyme, which is, you know, uh, so to look at the, the catalytic efficiency, okay, uh, remember, it's K-cat over K-M. On, on, in your slides, there might be the other way around, K-M over K-cat. The correct orientation is K-cat over K-M. Okay. Now, so remember, K-M is a measure of how quickly the enzyme substrate uh, complex is formed, and K-cat is how quickly the product is formed. Um, okay. So when we uh, divide the two, okay, um, we know that the K-cat for lysozyme is 0.5. Okay, K cut 0.5. We know, so it's it's it doesn't appear very quick, um, but the KM is extremely small, so it has a very tight affinity. Okay, <clears throat> so and that gives you this then. Okay, so the catalytic efficiency is that it can it can it can convert it can produce 0.983 uh, micromolar of product per second. Okay, whereas carbonic anhydrase, although the turnover number was quite big. When you compare it to the KM, when you measure, when you compare it as a, as a as a ratio of of the um, KM, it's not as impre impressive then. Okay, still it's much quicker than the than the lysozyme at 75 micromolar per second. Okay, now you might be thinking, well, uh, what what is the point of this? Okay, um, well, why why is lysozyme so much slower, has a very tight affinity for the substrate, but it's slower, whereas carbonic anhydrase is so much faster, but has a poor affinity for the substrate. So if, if you look at it, um, physiologically speaking, okay, uh, I'll put it in a physiological context, well, what we see is that with, with lysozyme, okay, the, the, let, let's take a step back and let's talk about what lysozyme is. It's an enzyme which breaks down the cell wall of bacteria. Okay, so lysozyme. So all kinds of things release lysozymes in, in your cells. Your tears will have lots of lysozyme. Your immune, not, not many of your immune cells will have will produce and secrete lysozyme. Okay, <clears throat> so lysozyme is really about destroying pathogens, bacteria. Okay. Now, obviously, pathogens can uh, when they get in, when they get into your body, uh, they can uh, if they're not dealt with quickly, they can flourish. Okay, and that can be very dangerous because that can cause uh, a systemic infection um, and cause big problems down the line. Okay, now it's very rare that we have bacteria in our bodies. Okay, so it, it then it makes sense that what we do need is a way of binding. If there is even a small amount of uh, bacteria present, okay, it makes sense that the enzyme binds to it quickly, okay, and that's why this is represented here as a small KM, okay. So in other words, uh, lysozyme will bind to the substrate really quickly. So uh, evolutionary speaking, that makes complete sense because there isn't much bacteria in our bodies. We know how dangerous bacteria are, so it's 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 really important that we uh, uh, destroy it as quickly as possible. Okay, but in order to destroy it, okay, we need to find the substrate. Okay, 
uh, the enzyme has to bind, bind, bind to the substrate, okay, or it has to bind to the bacteria, bacterial cell wall, okay. So the affinity has to be tight in order to, um, in order to locate the substrate, in order to locate the the bacteria. Now, looking at carbonic anhydrase, okay, it's a bit different. There will never be a shortage of carbon dioxide. Your cells are constantly producing carbon dioxide, okay, through cellular respiration. So there's there's never really a shortage of carbon dioxide. So we don't really need a high affinity, okay, because there's so much of it. But what we do need is we need a high turnover number, okay, because we need to have a have a very quick and rapid way of um, removing the carbon dioxide from the circulation, okay. So it doesn't it doesn't need to bind tightly because there's so much of it, but once it's bound, we need to deal with it quickly. Okay. Right then, now let's look at uh, how do we get K and and Vmax from a graph from a graph. Okay. How we get Km and Vmax from a graph? Now, in the previous graphs, we saw that uh, we saw this nice hyperbolic graph. Okay, uh, so if it's a straight line, proportional, then it plateaus off. Now, because the uh, because you would need immense amounts of substrate to actually reach the V max, uh, you never reach the V max uh, when we're doing experiments. Okay, and also because it's a curved graph, we have to then approximate. Uh, the km values. So we we're assuming that the vmax is is somewhere over here, and then we have to sort of approximate the fifty percent of vmax to get the km. Okay, so that's not very accurate. Okay, so the km and vmax can only be approximated from uh, those curved graphs. Okay, a more precise value for km and vmax can be obtained though. Okay. And the way we do that is by plotting a double reciprocal plot, okay, and that's called a line weaver Berg plot, named after the people who came up with it, okay. And it's basically, as it says, a double reciprocal. So it's one over velocity and one over substrate, okay. So in the in the curved graph, it would just simply be velocity over substrate, okay. But now we're doing one over velocity and one over substrate. And uh, as a general rule, if you if you if you do get these curved graphs and you wanted to get a, a better sort of a, a straight line, okay, you, you would need to do a double reciprocal plot of, of the graphs. Okay. Now, once you do that, you'll get the, uh, the points plotted on, and then you just draw the line of best fit. Okay, the line of best fit. And, and you know, to do this nowadays, you, you have uh, computer software to do that for you. But, the point at which the uh, line intercepts the y-axis, okay, that is that is represented here as Vmax, and where it intercepts the x-axis is Km, okay. But because it's a double reciprocal plot, this is one over Vmax. It's not Vmax; it's one over Vmax, and when it hits the x-axis, it's not Km; it's one over Km, okay. And remember. This part of the line is extrapolated. You or you only have uh, points to plot on the positive side of the graph, okay? But if you uh, if you draw drew the line of best fit and continued on, on the negative side of the graph and it intercepts the um, uh, the x-axis, that that there would be the one over the km, okay? So then, okay. So if we take this example here, okay, we've extra we've got the uh, we've done uh, the, a double reciprocal plot, okay, we've extrapolated the line, so now it intercepts both the y-axis and the x-axis, okay. Now at the y-axis, it, it it intercepts it at 0 0.02 roughly, so 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05, okay. So let's just assume it's not quite there, but let's just say for uh, simplistic reasons um, <clears throat> that it intercepts it as not at 0 0.02. Okay, so because it's a one over 0 0.02, this is what you would do then: one over 0 0.02, which gives you 50. Okay, so remember this is V max, 
Okay, that's that's the value you get then. Now x axis, it intercepts it here. Okay, so no point. This is this is in um, increments of 0 0.02. Okay, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.08, 0 0.1. Okay, so again, we're just approximating here, just for this, just to keep it simple. It's 0 0.04. So one over 0 0.04 is 25, okay? And so that's how you would calculate um, the Vmax and the Km from a line weaver bug plot. Okay. So there's a few questions. I'm so I'll just skip through these questions and get to the next bit. So enzyme inhibition, okay. Um, so enzyme inhibition is obviously uh, extremely important. Okay, everything we talk about really is really important, but um, and it's difficult to stress how important inhibition of enzymes are because it's a way the cells can regulate. It's it's a mechanism by which cells can regulate the activity of enzymes. Okay, it's a way by which drugs work on enzymes. Okay, now, so enzyme inhibitors are molecules that interfere with catalysis. Okay, straightforward, slowing or stopping altogether enzymatic reactions. Okay, now, the, the example that I've shown here is uh, is aspirin. Okay, here's aspirin. Okay, we know that aspirin is up is a mild painkiller. How 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 does it do that? Well, if you know a little bit about pain, pain is mediated by inflammation. So if you can block inflammation, you can uh, minimize pain. Okay. Um, now, pain. Okay. So inflammation is mediated by uh, it's, it's it's a complex process and is mediated by all kinds of chemicals. But prostaglandins are, are one of the major major ones. Okay. Uh, now the process of making prostaglandins, okay, is mediated by cyclooxygenases. Okay, so here we have a cyclooxygenase, and it and it facilitates this reaction. Okay, it facilitates the reaction to produce prostaglandins, and prostaglandins then uh, <clears throat> mediate pain or stimulate pain. So if you can if you can stop prostaglandin production, okay, uh, you can stop pain. So cyclooxygenases help with prostaglandin production, and so the way the, the way the uh, aspirin works, or the way aspirin works, is that the aspirin binds to the active site. Okay, there's a covalent, covalent modification, and it basically removes the cyclooxygenase because uh, it binds to it. Okay, it binds covalently, and now the substrate, the initial substrate. Uh, the, or rather, the natural substrate can't go in there because it's it's been modified. Okay, so you have cyclooxygenases which become inactivated. Okay, you can't produce prostaglandins, and therefore you can't uh, produce inflammation, and therefore you reduce pain. Okay, aspirins uh, are what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, it's just like ibuprofen is. Okay, these are non-steroidal anti uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs okay um now these cyclooxygenases if anybody's interested are involved with all kinds of processes it's not just about producing prostaglandin for pain purposes there are other other processes by for which cyclooxygenases are important okay and one of them is the production of mucus on your, on your on your st in, in in your st stomach, okay. The inside stomach lining has a layer of mucus, and prostaglandins are uh, not sorry, cyclooxygenases are important in the production of this mucus, okay. So people who take lots of aspirin, um, okay, uh, for pain purposes or for other purposes such as uh, uh, preventing blood clots. So people who also have uh, susceptibility to heart disease. Okay, their their, doc, their doctor will, will prescribe aspirin as a means to what we call thin their blood. 
Okay. When we say thinning their blood, it's basically what, what we're saying is that we're preventing blood clots. Okay. And blood clots are in the blood vessels, especially if it's the heart, will lead to a heart attack. Okay. So people who take aspirin for other other reasons, such as as pain relief or preventing blood clots, okay, uh, they will also have uh, effects. So one of the side effects is the Product is the susceptibility to stomach ulcers, okay? Because you're preventing or you're reducing the production of mucus in the, in, in your in your stomach, okay? Mucus is mucus is there to protect the stomach lining from the acid, so you can't produce enough mucus, okay? The corrosive acid in the stomach then just penetrates the um, and erodes the inside lining of your of your of your stomach, okay? And that leads to stomach ulcers. Now, coming back to inhibitors, okay. Now there are, there are there's there are reversible inhibitors, okay. So they're rapid binding, uh, and release from the enzyme, and there's an equilibrium to that. So they bind and they come off, okay. So in other words, the inhibitor doesn't bind co co doesn't bind covalently. Now there, sorry, in 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 terms of reversible inhibitors, okay, the uh, the types of inhibition, okay can be uh, determined by the effect of the inhibitor on KM and Vmax. Okay, so we, we can get a, uh, an idea of, of the type of inhibitor, uh, what type of reversible inhibitor it is when we look at the impact on KM and Vmax. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> irreversible uh, Inhibitors, as as the tight as the name suggests, are very tightly bound to enzyme, and and they es essentially don't come off. Okay, so once they're bound, that's it. They're bound. Um, now they can be bound either covalently, okay, which explains why they don't come off. Okay, but in some cases they're they they're not covalent. They're not covalent, but they're so tight that they effectively don't come off, even though they're not covalently bound. Okay, um, so there's three types of um, reversible inhibition, competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive. This last one, uncompetitive, is very rare. Okay, now as far as the competitive inhibition is concerned, um, the as the name suggests, it's competitive, so it's competing for the active site. So the inhibitor, as well as uh, the inhibitor, binds to the active site. Okay, so it's competing with the substrate. With the act for the active side, so it's really a ratio. So if you have lots of in inhibitor knocking about, okay, it will outcompete for the active side against the substrate. But then you have, if you have more substrate knocking about than than you have in inhibitor, then the substrate will win over. Okay, so it's a measure of how effective the competitive inhibitor is depends upon um, how much of it there is around. Okay. Non-competitive, as again, as the name suggests, is not competing for the active site, but rather the inhibitor binds elsewhere. Okay, and so we often call these non-competitive inhibitors allosteric inhibitors. Okay, so it binds uh, some distance away from the active site, and this really uh, affects the enzyme in its uh, three-dimensional structure. So as soon as the uh, competitive inhib no sorry non competitive inhibitor binds it changes it binds somewhere other than the active site it changes the shape of the uh, enzyme in other words it changes the three dimensional structure of the uh, enzyme okay and as it does that it doesn't allow substrate to bind to the active site okay because it's it's just it's made the the whole three dimensional structure of the enzyme different okay and it makes the substrate uh binding into the active site much more difficult so it's it's it doesn't really happen then and that interferes with turnover okay uncompetitive is very rare okay because it binds to the enzyme substrate complex so it doesn't bind to the enzyme when it's on its own it binds specifically when the enzyme is bound to the substrate okay so as soon as the enzyme substrate complex is formed this is when the uncompetitive inhibitor comes in binds to it and basically locks everything so uh, it the enzyme substrate complex can't undergo the next reaction to form product okay so it does interfere with turnover
Now, uh, so this here, this diagram here just shows you the differences in terms of how the inhibitor impacts um, on the enzymes. Okay, so if it's competitive, it uh, the enzyme binds to the inhibitor. Okay, to form the enzyme inhibitor complex. Okay, so this is this is a stage at which the inhibitor binds. Now for non-competitive, okay. For non-competitive, the enzyme can bind the inhibitor, okay, because it doesn't bind to the active site, so so therefore it can bind to the enzyme even when it's complex with the substrate, because it's not binding at the active site, so the substrate is free to bind to the active site, okay, um, and once it's bound to the once the substrate is bound together with the inhibitor, uh, with the enzyme, we get this enzyme inhibitor substrate complex. Either form in either form, the enzyme doesn't work. So as soon as the inhibitor is bound, bound to the enzyme, okay, in the absence or in the presence of substrate, the enzyme becomes neutralized. Okay, it doesn't work any longer. Okay, whereas with the enzyme substrate, um, so with with uncompetitive inhibition, the inhibitor binds specifically to the enzyme substrate complex. Okay, so it doesn't bind to the enzyme. It only binds to the enzyme substrate complex, so you get this enzyme inhibitor substrate complex formation. And again, okay, the enzyme is neutralized. Okay, so it doesn't work. Now, coming back to competitive, okay, it uh, the inhibitor is competing for the active site uh, against the substrate. Okay, so um, it's a simple case of if you you can increase the you can overcome the inhibition by just putting more substrate in into the mix. Okay, putting more substrate into the mix, you outcompete the inhibitor for the active site. Okay, whereas with the non-competitive in, 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 inhibition, okay, increasing substrate concentration cannot overcome the inhibition because remember the inhibitor doesn't bind to the active site; it binds to the um, uh, somewhere else on the enzyme. Okay, so you can't overcome inhibition by uh, increasing the amount of substrate. Okay. Now, uncompetitive. Okay. Um, is a bit different because what we're doing is that because the inhibitor doesn't bind to the empty enzyme, and it only binds to the enzyme in its enzyme substrate complex. The inhibitor becomes more active or more potent, if you like, when you have more substrate. If you have more substrate, the bigger the chance you're going to form enzyme substrate complex, and therefore the bigger the chance uh, the inhibitor will bind. Okay, so increasing the substrate concentration actually favors the inhibition by the inhibitor. Okay, so you can see, can't you, that. Uh, uh, Looking at the KM and V maxes, because you're over here, you're overcoming it, overcoming it with increased concentrations of inhibitor. Um, over over here for non-competitive, nothing happens by increasing substrate concentrations. But over here, by increasing substrate concentrations, you're increasing inhibition. Okay, so you can also you can already start to picture what impact it will have on the KM and V maxes. Okay. So, okay, uh, this is just some text just to describe what we just talked about. But uh, looking at competitive in inhibitor, okay, uh, what we see with, with regards to KM and Vmax, okay, uh, with competitive inhibition, the Vmax is unchanged, okay, uh, but the uh, the KM, okay, is changed because remember. Uh, the KM is a measure of how tightly the substrate binds. But if you have more inhibitor, you're out competing the substrate. Therefore, you need more substrate. Okay. So, because you need more substrate, um, KM will be increased. Okay. For non competitive inhibition, okay. Uh, because the substrate doesn't bind or doesn't compete for the active site, okay. The KM appears unaltered, doesn't change.
okay? But uh, because the inhibitor binds elsewhere and it affects the uh, enzyme's ability to perform catalysis, Vmax, okay, is decreased, okay? And it's decreased proportionally uh, to the enz inhibitor concentration. So the uh, the more inhibitor you have, okay, uh, the bigger the um, the drop in Vmax. Okay. Now with uncompetitive, okay, uh, because you're uh, increasing inhibition by increasing the substrate concentration, okay, <clears throat> Vmax will be decreased. And also KM will be decreased. So both of those decrease, KM and Vmax. Okay. Now when we look at when we look at uh, look at these results in a in a graph, this is what we see. Okay. So these are the uh, this line this green line represents increasing concentrations concentrations of inhibitor in the mix. Okay. So this is for competitive inhibition. Okay. You can see. By increasing uh, the amount of inhibitor, the Km okay, is changed, but the Vmax remains unchanged. Okay, so when it when it hits the when it intercepts the y-axis is the Vmax, when it hits the K or when it hits the x-axis is the Km. So you can see that um, uh, the Vmax doesn't change, but the Km changes. With non-competitive inhibition, okay, we did say that the Vmax changes, okay, but the Km remains the same, okay. Whereas with uncompetitive inhibition, okay, uh, the Vmax changes as well as the Km, okay. So uh, this demonstrates quite quite easily. Uh, the differences in um, in the plots you would achieve with these different types of inhibitors. Just to finish off, then uh, here are a list of uh, common um, drugs that people would be administered for all kinds of diseases. Okay, uh, so this one here at the top, angiotensin converting enzyme. Okay. Um, the the name of the inhibitor or the uh, the name of the drug is ram ramipril, and this uh, inhibitor acts in a competitive way. Okay, so it it competes for the active site. If anybody's interested, angiotensin converting enzyme. Okay, it's part of uh, the renin angio uh, angiotensin aldosterone pathway. Okay, and it's important for regulating uh, blood volume. Okay, uh, people who are susceptible to heart disease, uh, it's 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 usually high blood pressure that triggers off uh, an event. Okay, so if you can reduce blood pressure, you re you minimize your or rather you reduce the the chances of them uh, developing um, heart attacks and okay or strokes even. Okay. And the way that, the way this works is the so the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, is, is is through a is through a, a, a pathway the renin angiotensin angiotensin aldosterone pathway okay and this part of the reaction happens uh, in the lungs okay um, and basically once the once once the process is complete it uh, the final product uh, tells your kidneys to reabsorb more salt. Okay, if you re when you reabsorb more salt, you reabsorb more water. That water ends up in the blood, in the blood plasma. Your blood plasma volume, go volume goes up, and the more blood you have, uh, the more of it that's pressing against the sides of your blood vessels, and that's blood pressure. Okay, so the bigger the volume, uh, the bigger the pressure, and the bigger the blood pressure. Okay. Uh, so PDE5, uh, so. <laughs> Comically known as Viagra, I guess, uh, also worked. Um, also works in a competitive way, okay. And it's uh, it's based on nitrous oxide, so it's, it's a gas which helps to um, uh, to to reverse uh, 
vasodilation of smooth muscle cells. Okay, so you know blood flows in 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 um, blood vessels. Okay, and around many blood vessels you have smooth muscle cells, and these smooth muscle cells uh, can relax and con con contract. Okay, and based on their relax relaxation or contraction, it can alter blood flow in these blood vessels. Okay, so um, we can reverse vasodilation. So in other words, we can make the blood vessels constrict, and as they constrict, blood flow, um, the the pressure, the pressure of the blood flow increases. Okay, so <clears throat> there's another one, cytochrome C oxidase, which we'll talk about in cellular respiration. Okay, cyanide. Uh, it's not a drug, obviously, but uh, it's it's a poison. Okay. Uh, and cyanide affects the electron transport chain, okay, uh, especially this enzyme in the electron transport chain, mm -hmm. cytochrome C oxidase, and again, it does in a competitive manner. Okay. Uh, penicillin, the antibiotic, uh, works by, it works in a non-competitive fashion, okay, so it doesn't bind at the active site, it binds elsewhere, okay, and it's important because it uh, prevents the enzyme uh, transpeptidase from making cross links in the cell wall okay that's that's required to make the cell wall more robust uh, more impenetrative okay and penicillin stops that so it makes the cell wall more flimsy and uh, it doesn't so fluids water and all kinds of things can just get inside the cell and, and burst the cell so it, it becomes non-viable okay and then we have the last one here, poly ADP ribose polymerase. This enzyme here is important, okay, because it uh, it repairs DNA mutations caused by uh, caused by mutated BRCA proteins, okay, breast cancer proteins. Okay, um, so what what generally happens is that uh, the the, the <clears throat> this enzyme doesn't quite fix the mutations. Okay, because because the mutated because the because it's mutated because of these uh, uh these proteins here. Okay, so we can inhibit this this enzyme by this um this molecule here. Okay, uh, it's a drug, it's a it's a chemotherapy drug, PARP inhibitor. It um <clears throat> it impacts on this enzyme, but uh, it does it in a in an uncompetitive way. Okay, so the more you have of this enzyme, okay, which you will find more and more in cancers, okay, the more you have of this enzyme and the substrate that it's bound to, the DNA, okay, the better this inhibitor works. Okay, so it tends to target the breast cancer cells, but but it can also impact on other cells which are not cancerous. Okay, hence the uh, the side effects. Right then. Um, I think that's about it. There's a few questions. Uh, again, I'm gonna skip skip through them. Okay, so just bear with me. Okay, so there we have it. So hopefully, again, let me just go back to the beginning. Look at the learning outcomes. Okay, so we've been through every single one of these learning outcomes now. Okay, so we've looked at enzyme kinetics. We've looked at enzyme kinetics in the context of KM and Vmax. We've looked at the effect of substrate concentrations on en enzyme catalyzed reactions. Okay, we've looked at how do we calculate or how do we get KM and Vmax uh, from graphs. Okay, and then to finish up, we looked at inhibition, the different types of reversible inhibition. But we also mentioned that there was, um, there was there was also irreversible inhibition as well, but we focused on reversible. Okay, and we looked at how these inhibitors impacted on KM and Vmax. Okay, so that's the end. So, if that's like I said, if there's any questions, anything that you don't didn't quite understand, uh, send me an email, um, and uh, we'll see. I'll see if I can address those concerns. Okay, right then, all the best. Goodbye and good luck with the exam.